So, hello everyone. Welcome to the first online Arable Scotland event. And we hope that you've had a nice day so far. This is the last session of the day, I believe, and it's plant health, best practice in the UK and New Zealand. And thank you for joining us. Um, this session is led by Scotland's Plant Health Centre. And if you want to find out more about us, you can look at the exhibitors in the visual marquee on the Arable Scotland website and find out more about us. My name is Ian Tote, I'm the director. And Fiona Burnett, who is well known at this event, is the agriculture sector lead for the centre. We have about one hour for this session. There are going to be three talks and a discussion. And um, the three speakers are Fiona Burnett and Andy Evans from SRUC. And we're delighted to welcome Joe Drummond from the Foundation for Arable Research in New Zealand. And it's tomorrow early morning for her, hence the reason that we're meeting late. Um, David's not speaking, but we've got with us David Ellerton from Hutchinson's Agricultural Services in Cambridgeshire, who's going to be joining us for the discussion after the questions uh, in about half an hour. We hope the talks will stimulate you and there'll be lots of questions and discussion. And we would like you please to write any questions that you have in the question box, which I believe is at the bottom right of your screen. And please don't wait till the end of the talks, but uh, start writing whenever you feel the need and we'll get on to the questions at the end. We won't be asking for questions verbally today just because it's not so easy to do um, using this system, but um, please do write things down as soon as you have a question to ask. And then at the end, we'll select questions after some of the talks and also for the discussion. So welcome again. And without further ado, we'll start with the first speaker, who is Fiona Burnett. She's the sector lead for agriculture for the Plant Health Centre, as I've said. She's a professor of pathology and her main interest is in IPM and pesticide stewardship. She's the head of crop and soil systems research at SRUC, and her title is Challenges and Opportunities in Sustainable Disease Management. Disease Management. So over to you, Fiona. Thanks, Ian. Um, and hopefully you can see my um, slides now. Everybody seeing them OK? Um, so, yeah, just to add my welcome uh, to Ian's there and thank everyone for joining this Q&A session. And what I wanted to sort of start with was really why we're thinking about sustainable practices in plant health at all. So in our arable crops, we're sitting with these multiple disease challenges, um, rising fungicide program costs year on year. And that disease burden is part of why we're seeing yield plateaus on farm, despite improvements in variety yields and trials. And then that's layered on top of, we know we have climate and biodiversity crises that are driving policies um, to ask us to behave in more sustainable ways in our cropping practices. And market pressure is also asking for more sustainable practices. And again, that major challenge is layered over three technical issues. As I see it, um, we have numerous pesticide withdrawals taking away what we're used to. Um, we have big issues with fungicide resistance in our arable crops, and we're victims of climate change as well. So we have you know, extremes of climate, and this year's fairly typical with a very wet autumn and then that very dry spring. So, Often IPM, I feel, is portrayed as complex and difficult, but I, I want to kind of float the idea this evening that there are some very easy wins. So we know that um, we're very comfortable in using our fungicides at the times where we know they're most effective, and that's a key way of reducing the use of marginal um, sprays where we don't get yields or good profits. So with wheat, it's about targeting those upper leaf layers. And with barley, we understand the importance of those early sprays. So that concept that we really use our fungicides at the times where they're most effective is, for me, a simple example. And then the other thing I wanted to air was that we know that varietal resistance is another area where we're quite comfortable in using variety resistance as a tool, but probably what we're less good at is moderating our fungicide use to reflect that reduced risk. 
and getting more comfortable with those scenarios where we can reduce the risk, I think, is really key. So the slide that I'm showing there is just flagging uh, an AHDB project with the partners that you can see, um, where um, we're looking at, at wheat in, if you like, on the left-hand side, the most vulnerable, the highest risk scenario, so a susceptible variety, early drilled, um, and at three different levels of input. And at the right end, you've got a resistant variety, late drilled, so a lower risk scenario. And you can see there the low, moderate and high fungicide programmes, as you would expect, responding well in the very high risk scenario. But if you come to the right there, you're only adding another tenth of a tonne between a low input and a high input programme. So that's somewhere where we can build confidence in these situations where we can reduce our inputs. I wanted to raise the spectre of ramularia tonight um, as being one in our arable crops where we have particularly acute issues. So it's a disease where we've developed resistance in all our um, systemic chemistry. And the, the blow this year of losing chlorothalonil has really diminished how we can manage this disease. We know breeding solutions are a much longer game. But again, that concept that we can optimise the timings in managing ramble area, we know that the T2 timing is the more effective of the two barley timings. We only have one effective group at the moment, so propioconazole and uh, Revistar, the new Revisol, uh, Azole, which has improved on the efficacy. So that's, these are pluses. It's a stress-related disease. So again, sort of minimising complex um, spray mixes is something we can do that's helpful. And it is an example where other options, um, biostimulants, micronutrients may play, and, and other multi-sites may play a role going forward, but they're not as consistent and we need to build that awareness of risk and understand where they might be, be helpful. So we've got these, not just pressures to improve our IPM, our integrated and sustainable practices, but we've got a desire to do it as well. And it's a, a cliche that, um, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, but I've used it anyway. Um, but this is work I wanted to introduce tonight, which was done by a colleague of mine, Henry Chryson, with colleagues in England and Ireland. So trying to build a metric to measure IPM, how do you quantify it? So this was built on farmer participants uh, and it used what farmers perceive as important in IPM to build this metric. And what was really interesting is that farmers really value the preventative measures. So it's things like rotation, resistant varieties, certified seeds, things that prevent problems up front. And again, an encouraging feature there is that we're not starting from ground zero. The mean score in that is 67%, and English and Scottish growers tended to score higher than Irish farmers. But again, within that cohort, there are some farms that are really scoring very highly. And again, I wanted to air tonight, you know, what can we learn from them um, that we could maybe copy? So some of these high scoring farms, the really distinctive thing about them was this link between their familiarity with IPM and those higher scores. So these were people that were getting knowledge and information and the source was important. So they were going for open days and trial events. They were engaging in discussion groups. And a really strong signal here was the engagement with independent agronomists. And that actually ties in really nicely with a piece of a project that we commissioned from the Plant Health Centre to look at where people are getting their plant health uh, information from. And what we find there, as you might intuit, Published literature, refereed papers are very highly trusted, but they're not very highly read. Um, Twitter, again, as you might intuit, was, was not very well trusted, but interesting that it wasn't actually very well read either. And again, that feature, the one-to-one -one, um, from trusted sources where they're pulling out the salient points from a myriad of information was, was really key. And that um, reinforces what Henry found in his work. So these are features that I think we can use going forward to try and improve our, our integrated practices. Going forward, you know, to pick a few positives, I mean, new fungicides will remain very key. Um, so great this year that we had the new uh, triazole, Revisol um, coming in there. Uh, and looking forward to next year, we're excited to have Inatrek. So that's an example of a genuinely new active, which will allow us to begin to mix and alternate and not be as reliant on a very limited palette of fungicides in our arable crops. 
And coming behind that, there's another generation of what are being described as new strobilurin type uh, fungicides, which will be active against the pathogens that have uh, resistance to strobilurins at the moment. So we are losing a lot of pesticides, but we are gaining a few, and it's key that we steward and protect them. So I wanted to finish um, uh, tonight just to think about, you know, new technologies and new tools will be a really key feature going forward. And this concept of wizards v profits is quite widely talked about in food and farming strategy. So the wizards believe that new technology will help us out in the future is very positive. And the profits are the ones that um, point out the inconvenient truths and, and you know, fight against the market hype uh, and are more attuned to the fact that major change will be needed, otherwise the future might not be positive. So some of the, the wizard type solutions, um, certainly biologicals and alternatives to pesticides, things like elicitors that are quite widely used now in, in cash crops and, and fruit crops will become a feature. Um, remote sensing and imaging will make us much more accurate in where we can target and how we can time our fungicides and that precision techniques and things will similarly let us find and target the issues and reduce our reliance on pesticides. So these will come but it's really crucial we don't ignore the tools, tools that we've got in the here and now so um, it's not a choice between wizards and prophets, we, we can use both of them. Um, so I wanted to finish, I haven't really talked about fungicide resistance, but it is a major issue. But I wanted to finish tonight with maybe two points we could bring up in the discussion. So that concept that if IPM seems complex, then what are the acceptable options? Those preventative measures maybe um, that are easy to pick up, varietal resistance, rotation, and just reacting to sim simple measures of risk, um, weather, tillage, and so date. And then going back to the, the stewarding against resistance, this is an area where we know that reducing um, our reliance on fungicides would help us um, to steward against resistance. But then perhaps if the perception is that it's not economic to reduce inputs, maybe we keep our inputs high on those very high risk crops, but within that, we steward as best we can and we avoid those marginal sprays. Uh, we reduce the risk of the high risk, we reduce our use of high risk fungicides and we increase our use of those lower risk multi-site options at the moment. So I'll finish with those two points um, and hand back to you, Ian. Thanks. Thank you very much, Fiona, for that um, short but very informative talk. Um, I was hoping to ask you a question. I can't see any questions in the panel at the moment, so please do write questions if you have some. I'm sure there are some based on that talk, but I'll just ask you one in terms of time. Uh, could I ask, how can we manage ramularia, which is a, a very important disease, without um, CTL and uh, are there new varieties of chemistry that are going to help with that? Uh, not immediately would be the short answer. So ramularia um, is a very hard one to manage at the moment. Um, the fact that we don't have good varietal resistance is an issue um, and there's some difference in tolerance in the current varieties but very variable between sites which is why it's not part of the recommended list. Um, in terms of managing it, um, there is new chemistry coming which will help augment because at the minute when we've only got azoles and we know um, that the older azole, the prothioconazole, has faded in its efficacy, that's a really um, unsustainable way to go forward with just one bit of chemistry. Um, so the addition of, an, uh, of another fungicide behind that in a couple of years will help and then hopefully breeding solutions will arrive behind that. Okay, thank you Fiona. I'll, I'll move on if you don't mind to keep to time and we'll move on to Joe Drummond. Again, many thanks, Joe, for taking the time to talk to us today. And it's at least one good thing to come out of the coronavirus crisis that we're all getting used to using the video links. And it's really the only way that we can hope to get somebody from New Zealand to uh, come and speak to us in one of these meetings. So we're really pleased that, that Joe managed to come. Joe is a senior research field officer in the Foundation for Arable Research, or FAR, in New Zealand. 
and FAR helps New Zealand arable growers with funding, research and technology transfer and interestingly and rightly the topics that they work on are driven by the growers and much like in the UK communications through online events such as this so I'm sure Joe's very used to this workshops publications in the FAR website. Joe's going to speak to us for about 10 minutes on the New Zealand experience of IPM, resistance, life without CTL and new products. So over to you, Joe. Thank you very much, Ian, and uh, good evening, everyone. Right, hopefully everyone can see that. Uh, this morning for us in New Zealand and this evening for you, um, as Ian said, I'm going to talk about um, experiences of using integrated pest management in New Zealand in our cereal crops. And I'm going to sort of start with what cropping rotations in New Zealand might look like, what the disadvantages and advantages of our system might be, and then I'm going to focus in on wheat and barley and how we manage our systems. And this time last year, Fiona was actually in New Zealand and spoke at our FAR conference and will be quite familiar with, uh, with the Canterbury Plains, which is where I am based. This is an example of a rotation that, um, that um, might be in Canterbury. Um, growers here would sort of implement something like this. And, and an average farm might be, say, 250 hectares. Um, and it, often they include animals as part of their rotation. So it might be finishing stock or it might be dairy support. Some farms have irrigation. And depending on where you are in New Zealand, your rotation might be quite diverse or it may be relatively narrow. And some other options that we have in our system, so often we have um, cereals as that sort of foundation in our, in our, um, our rotation. Uh, we also have grasses, so seed crops of ryegrass, coxfoot, fescue, brown top, um, seed brassicas such as oilseed rape, you can actually see some in the picture. Forage brassicas, things like kale, forage herbs like plantain that go into pasture mixes. Things like maize grown for silage and for grain. Clovers, predominantly white clover again, um, components in pasture mixtures, also um, red clover. Peas, so both the processed peas that you get in the supermarket and seed peas. Vegetable seeds such as radishes and carrots, potatoes and hemp. And there are various other crops and smaller quantities grown. And this complexity of rotation um, isn't on every farm, but often they will implement parts of these depending on what contracts they can get and what fits with their system. Also, having rotations like this also opens up other types of chemistry. So the likes of some vegetable seeds and things like peas also allow you to have spring options. And that opens up different lines of chemistry, particularly um, in, in terms of herbicide use. We're really lucky in New Zealand we don't have the issues with black grass. But where rotations are sort of narrower, we are starting to see issues creep in. And we know that um, controlling grass weeds and cereals is becoming increasingly problematic. I'll throw up this photo. This is a photo of a wheat crop I took a few years ago. Um, just to give you some context to our system, so prior to 2012, we were in a really rust-dominated system. Um, at that time, I actually lived and worked in the UK, so I wasn't aware of what was happening too much in New Zealand at that time. But once we hit that 2012 mark, we lost the strobilurins due to that single site mutation. And then after that point in time, we were in a really septoria-dominated environment. And we've got relatively few tools, and we've also um, seen, well, our current world record holder of 16.79 tonnes to the hectare is actually held with Oakley. So um, I remember working with Oakley when I was in the UK, and it, if you throw the book at it, it will perform really well, but it's a really dirty cultivar. And as a result, we've sort of become a victim of our own success. Um, so we're really looking to IPM to change, um, to change our system. And as a foundation to IPM, um, cultural tools are really important. And Fiona quite rightly said there is a perception that IPM can be quite challenging. But really, a lot of it is really basic. And a lot of farmers will be implementing IPM strategies on their farms without even knowing it. And we like to think of um, IPM as putting yourself into a high pressure or a low pressure scenario. And there are different, um, different tools within each of those that can determine um, what type of input system that you need. And 
sort of a foundation around that, and Fiona showed a really great slide, and we've been doing pretty much the same work in New Zealand, is cultivar selection. So that gives you a lot of power. Uh, it gives you flexibility, and you can have some confidence in your decision making. Also, uh, time of sowing is really important. Uh, if you're able to delay your time of sowing, even by as little as a fortnight, you're, you're not going to be, in some cases, um, reducing your yield potential, but it, it sort of gives you less um, exposure to, to pathogens. Um, if, you're in a, if you're in a rusty environment versus a stubble-borne environment, stubble-borne disease is much more difficult to control. Um, if you're in a rust environment, those same mutations that, um, that don't work on septoria are still lethal against rust. And of course, our weather plays a really important tool. I mean, the best fungicide out there is, in fact, dry weather. So for us, it's really looking at that key period between the start of stem extension and when ears emerge. And we're looking for periods of relative humidity over 85% for about 20 hours, and also that accompanied with leaf wetness. And I know that's um, those are the same parameters that fit into that Danish model, and we found that they work really well here. Also, if you have irrigation, so if you have an irrigated crop, you've got a thicker canopy, your growing season is longer. With that thicker canopy, you've got greater humidity lower in that canopy, which can help drive the disease. Likewise, if you're a dry land farmer, your canopy is going to be thinner, your growing season is shorter, and you've been, you're going to have uh, lower humidity. And this really, all of this together, it sort of gives you an idea of what sort of input system you're going to be operating under. If I jump through onto chemical tools, I've just done a bit of a table of the main active ingredients that we have uh, for use in our, in our cereals. We've got our triazoles, we've got our SDHIs, and you'll notice that we've only got one multi-site registered for use in cereals. We don't have chlorothanolol. We've had to rely on fulpit. Um, and we have strobulurins, but they, I've, I've mentioned earlier, are only active against the rust. The other thing with our triazoles, much like the rest of the world, we are experiencing sensitivity shift. So we're seeing that steady decline. And for us, it means that um, some of those older triazoles with less efficacy like epoxyconazole are being um, saved for our less critical, um, our less critical um, applications or our, more of our shoulder sprays. We're also looking to um, stack our azoles um, if we can and alternate them where appropriate. And they form the baseline of our, of our programs. Our SDHIs are okay for now. Um, this time last year, I saw some slightly worrying graphs, particularly with Bixafen, seeing sensitivity shifts coming out of the UK. They are okay for now in New Zealand, but they are quite risky. Fulpit is our only, our only multi-site. Um, we know that it reduces um, it, re it reduces disease severity, um, but we aren't seeing the corresponding yield advantage, but it is seen as a sound anti-resistance strategy. And we have a number of new actives that are going to be coming to the market, hopefully within the next year. And of those, they have performed at least as well as, if not better, than the current products that we have on the market. But last year we were in a quite a low disease pressure scenario, so we didn't see the same yield response to fungicide that we would normally experience. So what do our programs look like? As I mentioned, we have a triazole baseline, and that really is important because that's all we've got. Uh, we know because of the sensitivity shift that we need to keep that azole rate because it's that partial resistance. We know that we need to keep the rate of our azole quite high. So we always go in with at least 75% and then we layer up uh, our fungicide program based on our risk. So in a low disease pressure scenario, you might have um, drilled at the end of April, you might have a resistant cultivar, you um, might be in a dry sort of environment. And that's where we start having, you know, we look at our, our shoulder sprays. So do we need to use a T0 or not? And using the crop as your decision making tool. So if you go out and you walk your crop and you're at growth stage 30, you're about to hit growth stage 30 and you're clean all the way down, you can have a really good think about whether or not that T0 is going to pay its way. Um, I'm also going to say, um, I've used the word appropriate rate SDHI, and I actually pinched that from, from um, AHDB and NIAB tag because I think it's a really um, I think it's a really nice way of putting it because as Fiona when she came out and she talked about um, you know being sensible with our high risk chemistry, this is one way we can look at doing that. 
I put a multi-site in red, um, and that's really because we've seen that um, reduce the severity, but that that yield um, that yield in a wheat space. Um, we haven't seen that realised, but it is seen as that really sound anti-resistance strategy. The other thing you'll notice about these programs is that they are expensive. So if you're in that Rolls-Royce high disease pressure scenario, your disease program is going to cost you in excess of $300 a hectare. So I don't know, 150, 160 pounds for a hectare, which is an expensive type of brew. And you're really going to need to have um, really great fungicide response to be able to make that pay its way. I'll just sort of put a mention about what our T0.5s and T4s. Um, in some scenarios, people like to do that leaf layering type approach, hitting every leaf. Um, a T1.5, not something that's really typical, but sometimes we find if we get into a position um, where you're inadvertently straddling a flag leaf, that sometimes happens, and it certainly happened um, in, in the south of the South Island last year where there was really poor weather around the T1 timing, so it was a bit late, um, and then really poor weather all the way through meant that um, meant that flag leaf applications were a bit late as well. So that's sometimes where that, where that spray can happen. And T4s, um, again, if we're in a really, really high disease pressure scenario, it, it, it can be used, but we tend not to, because you start running into issues with withholding, different, um, withholding periods. I'll jump through onto barley because that's way more problematic. Um, and as Fiona quite rightly mentioned, um, it's a real challenge to control. And for us, it's all about timing. Um, when the disease appears in the crop depends on how much potential yield you stand to lose. So if you get hit in a bad season, it can be up to 30%. Last year, we had low disease pressure all the way through the season and our, our yield losses were less than 10%. It's a real challenging thing because all of the IPM strategies and cultural control methods that we would um, intuitively use for controlling other diseases like septoria and wheat, we're not able to reliably do with ramularia. And this has come off the back of um, some survey work that we've done with plant and food research as part of a, um, a government funded program on managing ramularia. And we've collected barley samples after harvest from farms around New Zealand. And of the 29 samples that we've collected, um, it didn't matter what cultivar you had because all but one of them tested positive for ramularia DNA. And these were referenced against some samples that have come from the seed bank and they date back as far as 1969. And none of those tested positive for uh, ramularia DNA. So we've got a real challenge on our hands. The other things that were tested were uh, time of sowing, so it didn't matter if you were spring sown or autumn sown, and it didn't matter whether you were early or late within that season. It didn't matter if you were irrigated or dry land. It didn't matter what generation of seed you had. It didn't matter where in New Zealand you were. It didn't matter. If all of those factors that we'd, we'd typically sort of take into consideration, it didn't matter. You were pretty much guaranteed to have some presence of ramularia in your barley. What does that mean in terms of controlling it? Places a lot of pressure on our fungicide programs that are already very, very stretched. We've lost the strobilurins. Plant and food have done isolate testing. All of the isolates that we have in New Zealand are now um, insensitive to SDHIs. That's a real challenge. And we are starting to see our DMIs start to slip. So last year, again, um, disease came in really late, so we weren't seeing the same shifts, but in that 2018-19 year, that um, isopyrazam, we've used that in as experimental only treatment to really try and ground truth that isolate um, sensitivity shift, really struggling, and we're starting to see prothioconazole start to go the same way. So it's really a really challenging environment, but it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, we haven't got chlorothanolol, which is a challenge, but we have got fulpit. And we have found pretty consistently that fulpit, when applied in a mixture with prothioconazole, is going to reduce that. A, a, it's going to reduce the severity of ramularia, and B, it's also going to give you a yield hit depending on, on what season you're in. If it's, a, if it's a low disease pressure season, you struggle to get any response out of fungicides, it's significant. But we're finding that this is a, a pretty consistent thing across all our trials, but I will point out that that particular combination is quite weak on rust, so it does uh, need a strobilurin or, or indeed an SDHI to sort of cover your bases against that rust. So a challenging, um, a challenging system to be in. 
what's next for us in New Zealand? Well, we're really trying to recalibrate um, our eye as to what good disease management looks like. And we're all trained to uh, want to see a nice cream, clean green crop all the way through. And that often requires throwing quite a high input program at it. What we're finding is if we take some of those cultural tools like cultivar and time of sowing um, and multi and using our multi-site, that's a, that's a good anti-resistance strategy. If we overlap them, there is that sweet spot. So we can look to reducing some of our inputs without seeing any significant yield loss. And that's the spot that we really want to be in. And I'd just like to finally touch off, um, we've actually um, recently just started a very large multi-sector government funded program. So it's worth $27 million and it's going to last for seven years of which FAR is a participant. And FAR's involvement, um, certainly in the early stage, is really pushing that integrated pest management programs for, for wheat and then looking to scale that up to a farm scale. So for us, that's really focusing on flexibility of, of our cultivars and being able to um, successfully reduce our inputs where we need to and really taking um, a much sort of lighter touch with our program so looking to integrate biopesticides where, where appropriate um, and looking at elicitors and crop stresses and things like that so that's just um, an overview of, um, of where we're at in New Zealand um, so thank you very much for, um, for listening to my talk this morning this evening wherever you are <laughs> It's this evening here. Thanks, Joe. Um, we've got time for one quick question, and there's an interesting question from Ken, who's asking, what is the main driver for hemp growth in New Zealand, and what are the markets? Right. Um, again, hemp is not an area that I've done a huge amount of work, um, and it's a growing market. Um, mostly, I would say fibre, but um, if, you're, if you're keen by all means, jump on the FAR website and there's definitely someone within our team who can who can talk to you in that space. Okay, good answer. Thank you very much. Uh, because of time, we'll move on. And Andy, you don't have very long, but um, we are slightly behind time. So if you could try and keep to time. Andy no is uh, the Applied Practice Lead at SIUC. He's been an entomologist for over 30 years, specialising in IPM and um, in agriculture and horticulture crops and he's just completed a big plant health centre funded project on pesticide withdrawals in Scotland and we have put a summary on the plant health centre um, exhibition stand so if you do want to find a little bit out a little bit more out about what Andy is saying in this talk please do go and visit so Andy's going to talk about pesticide loss thanks Andy hey, cheers again um, yeah, so uh, as Ian said, uh, um, there's been a big uh, assessment really about the uh, the loss of pesticides within the whole uh, Scottish plant health sector. And I'm just really wanting to talk about the agriculture production sector uh, this evening. And as it says on the slide there, cereals, rape, legume and potatoes. And when you put them all together, uh, you're looking at out of the sort of top 50 pesticides that have been used over the last sort of two seasons or so, um, 12 of those are in the pie chart on the left, uh, highlighted in red, which are ones which are at a high risk of loss. In fact, some of them have been lost already, like lorethalonil, and we're losing the likes of things like thioclopred and so on. Uh, the yellow is the medium risk, so there's about 19 um, different active substances in there, and only about 19 we can maybe consider to be safe. So really over the next three or four years or so, we are going to lose a lot of um, pesticides within our, um, the production sector. When you think about it from a financial perspective, um, if you think that the total value of the Scottish output is about 717 million, uh, we're possibly going to lose almost a million of that down to, sorry, 98 million of that down to um, the pesticides which are at high risk of loss and this high risk of loss is not just reductions in yield it's also uh, the fact that the alternatives which are available for many of the pesticides which are going or are going to go but those alternatives are more expensive um, so really I think you know you've heard a lot about uh, IPM and 
resistant varieties and so on over the last couple of talks. And I think really we, we do need to think about looking at things like that in more uh, detail. But you know, some of the, the, the things I want to highlight really are that um, issues like the Abalia dwarf virus, for example, in cereals is potentially going to become problematic because on top of pesticides disappearing, like the neonix, we've also got issues with the fact that uh, we've got uh, aphids showing resistant to the pyrethroid insecticides, which are currently, at least for BOIDV in the autumn, are the only option. Uh, other products uh, have gone which may affect um, pest problems, things like cabbage stain clay beetle, which is already causing havoc down in, down in uh, southeast England. It is in Scotland and it's got the potential to perhaps become more problematic, particularly as we don't have the, uh, the arsenal to kind of control it. So really, um, uh, you know, when this report comes out, which hopefully will be very soon, because I'm just about hopefully going to submit it, uh, the final version, very shortly. Um, a lot of the things that have been talked about by both Fiona and Joe in terms of alternative approaches, the wizards and the profits, the biopesticides, uh, pesticide stewardship, looking after the pesticides that we do have, I think is, is really going to be crucial going into the next um, few years or so to make sure that uh, we have got a variety of options available to manage um, pest squeeze and diseases over the next uh, few years. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Um, I'm going to ask you a very quick question because we, we really are getting a little bit behind on time. Um, can you say something about, um, are there many new pesticides lined up to replace the ones that have gone? Well, it depends on the sector. I mean, um, obviously, uh, you know, Fiona's mentioned Inertrec as a coming in to, as a possible replacement for chlorothalonil. Uh, on the insecticide side of things, you know, there's not a huge amount of things kind of being lined up. Um, but I think the adoption of biopesticides, um, as Fiona alluded to, they're already being used within the um, like soft fruit sector and the uh, vegetable sector. And I think they have potential to come to be used within more arable crop production. But again, there is a cost element associated with them, which might mean that the cost of production for some of these crops may go up. But no, they are they can they are as effective as uh, some of the chemical options if they're used correctly. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, in t in t the interest of time, we're going to move to the discussion session. We've had a few questions. It would be nice to get more from the audience, so please feel free to write whatever comes to mind. You have these experts in the room that can help you answer the questions. Um, we're going to move to this discussion session, and that brings in David Ellerton as well. I'd like to say a little bit about David. He completed his PhD in spring barley pathology at the, uh, what was then SCRI, now the James Hutton Institute in 1980, so he's, he's come home, as it were. He spent four years in ADAS as a plant pathologist and then in ProCam Agricultural services where he built up a very big client, client base of over 17,000 acres. For the last 10 years, he's been at Hutchinson's Agricultural Services as technical director. And he's on numerous committees, including LEAF, the Fungicide Resistance Action Group, and British Crop Protection Council, just as examples. So without further ado, um, we'll start asking the panel some questions. Please feel free to write more. I've got a little list of questions that I produced earlier that I'm going to start with. And I think we'll start with David to hear your voice. David, with increasing levels of resistance to conventional plant protection products, in addition to pesticide losses, do you see a great potential for biological control products and biostimulants in the future? And just on that note, I know that Keith has written to say that he's quite um, skeptical, actually very skeptical about the hype on biostimulants. On biostimulants, could you say more about that, please? Yeah, I think it's it's right to be skeptical until there's proof that these things work. Certainly, there are a lot of claims uh, made for the uh, levels of pest and disease control from these products, but it's important we trial them <coughs> in advance to see if they do work. We've looked at a number of products, and we have seen some pretty good results. 
We've seen uh, good results as alternatives to multi-sites on septoria. We've seen some results on uh, pest control of aphids and so on and so forth. So, so they do work, probably not as good in most cases as conventional pesticides, but they certainly uh, can work and certainly we've seen evidence of that. But it's important to have evidence rather than make uh, claims w without being able to back them up. So I think it's right to be sceptical until we've got uh, actually got uh, got the proof there. In some cases, it looks like these biostimulants and so on actually can help the plant to actually overcome uh, pests and diseases. We talked earlier about ramularia being affected by stress. So any of these products that can help uh, the crop overcome stress can actually help in a secondary way, help them to fight off disease. So it might not be direct impact uh, on disease, but it can help the plant to fight it off. And in some cases, actually stimulate uh, uh, resistance mechanisms within the plant itself uh, to help. So certainly, I think they're going to become more important, but it's important that we do the, the work in advance, checking their efficacy. Thank you, David. Um, I'm not going to go around the panel to ask everybody because we've got questions coming in. So I think we'll move on to a different question, but that was uh, very well answered. And thank you for that, David. We have a question from James asking, how big a role does the panel think that soil health is going to play in the fight against weeds, pests and diseases? Maybe Joe can start with that. Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, certainly from a soilborne disease perspective, um, having really good soil health is going to, um, is going to be a, a factor, um, especially if we're going to start losing um, seed treatments, um, particularly things like neonics and some of the other chemistry. I know, for example, in New Zealand, we, um, we've we lost Galmano, that was our main tool against, against rust. So having um, really strong soil health may help in that, but as yet, um, we haven't done a whole heap of research in that space. Um, if I could maybe throw that out to the other members of the panel. Have your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I mean, I saw some amazing soils when I was out with you, Joe, um, and I see somebody's asked a question about the role of soil health there. So it goes back to the question, the biostimulant issue that we were talking about before. I think certainly more resilient plants um, will be better able to fight off infection. Again, that's probably an area where we don't quite have the understanding that we should, um, but within reason, well-nourished plants will be more um, resilient to to the yield knocks that we get from disease. We also okay. have to be aware of some of the microorganisms in the soil, the pythiums, the rhizoctonias, the phytophthoras, the takeals, the club roots and so on. So mm -hmm. it's important to know what's there and there are a number of tests now coming through where in advance you know these uh, microorganisms are present on the soil and it can help decide what crop is suitable to grow in that soil. So knowing uh, the health of soil is extremely important in planning your rotations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If I can quickly extending. butt in there. Yeah. Sorry. If I can quickly butt in there, I mean, you know, we've been doing some work here with uh, with Chagaskin Island where we've been looking at the the health of um, brassica of soils where brassica crops are grown in, and we we found that um, particularly with low input, uh, almost organic type soils. Yeah. They're much more resilient in terms of uh, having the microorganisms and nematodes which will um, tackle pests like cabbage root fly. So we were tending to see less cabbage root fly problems within organic crops, which have been where the soil has been managed well compared to uh, soils which have been kind of um, conventionally managed over, the, over over several seasons. Okay, thank you, panel. Um, we have a question for Joe, um, although I'm sure others might want to answer it as well, from Henry. In the high fungicide input wheat program, is the triazole uh, at T0 largely for septoria control? And if so, how often do you get return on the application? Okay, that, again, thank you. Good question. Um, predominantly in that high input um, environment, yes, it is for control of septoria. You might see um, a yield um, of a, a a return on that investment maybe one year and five maybe if you're lucky 
Um, typically with a T0, we see a yield increase of maybe 0.4 to 0.5 of a tonne. Um, if you think a typical LSD for a, for a field trial that we would run would be in the range of you know half a tonne to maybe 0.7 of a tonne, you know, it can pay, but not often. So have a really, really good think and really looking at cultivar resistance um, as being a really good tool there. So not often, can do. If it rains the entire way through October and November, yes, yeah, sure, but um, you know, not 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 often enough to warrant regular use, which is why we consider it sort of a shoulder spray at a less critical timing, which is why that epoxy sometimes fits into that space. Okay, so thanks. that's maybe one that Dave, I know David and I have talked about in the past, where one of the it's an easier one for us to take out when it comes to septoria but we have this uncertainty over yellow rust races which is partly why we are um more more used to using t naught so i mean your kind of take on that david we're in a slightly uncertain time when it comes to yellow rust be interesting yeah i, I think that's the key benefit at t naught of a triazole is to control of rust I mean, in the past, we've tended to go purely on the disease susceptibility from the recommended list. But as Fiona quite rightly said, with these new races suddenly appearing, you can't be certain that a nine rating for yellow rust is, is actually going to show in the field. So breakdown is happening quite fast. And I, my opinion is if you see rust in a variety, even if it's got a rating of nine, then you need to knock it out as soon as possible. And that T naught is an ideal way of, of knocking it out early, because once it gets established, it can do a lot of damage in a very short space of time. These new races are very aggressive and the triazoles are the best at knocking it out. The tebuconazoles, the epoxiconazoles, the cipriconazoles of this world to knock it out quickly before it takes hold. OK, thank you. Sorry, thank you very much. Let's move on. Um, a nice question from Alan about the Green Deal being promoted in the EU27, which will increase organic farming to 25%, increase agroecology, reduce pesticide use by as much as 50%, and separate advice from agrochemical supply. Does the panel think we should embrace this model in the UK agriculture post-Brexit? Why don't we start with David on that one? Yeah, certainly, I, I think we ought to go very much towards uh, utilising integrated pest management techniques to reduce the dependency on pesticides. I think that's extremely important. As far as resistance is concerned, the more you use key products, the more you select for resistance. So that's important. However, to set a, a limit, I think, is very dangerous. I think we need to use appropriate products in different situations. So as Fiona showed in a slide earlier, if you're using a, late, uh, a resistant variety late sown, it gives you much more opportunity to reduce the use of pesticides rather uh, a, you know, compared to a high risk variety early sown. So it's tailoring to uh, the situation. As far as uh, separating uh, advice and supply is concerned, I think it's important to have trust in your advisor that they're doing what's right technically uh, on your farm. And I think if you've got uh, an advisor that does that, I don't think you need to separate the two out. It's having trust in your, in your advisor. And the important thing is if you say why you're using that program, it's important they can justify it. And I think that's what it's down to at the end of that is justifying what you're recommending on crops. Thank you very much. Um, Unless there's anything the other panels, what members want to say, I think we can move on. Fiona? Well, just to follow up on that point, so I highlighted in um, the work that we've shown on the, on the high achievers in IPM, that engagement with your agronomist, the discussion is a really good um, driver. So it may not be the independence versus um, linked, but it is the fact that you're questioning um, and engaging in that sense. So I think that's a kind of key piece of evidence that we've got. Yeah, because it's very much teamwork between the advisor and the farmer themselves. And that discussion is vital so that the farmer understands the approach that you're actually using. Yeah, totally. And that comes down to choice of varieties and cultivations and drill date, et cetera, et cetera. It's all part of it rather than this is the product to use. It's all part of the whole picture. Thank you, David. Thank you, Fiona. Um, so we'll move on and we, I'm going to make the most of the fact that Joe's with us today. So I'm going to ask Joe another question, if you don't mind. And 
The question's from David. Um, has much work been done in New Zealand with cropping mixtures, for example, wheat and beans together or oilseed, rape and pea mixtures? Um, are you asking from a cover crop sense in terms of weed suppression or is this a disease specific um, question? I'll throw it back at the, at, at the person. Well, you can uh, we do, <laughs> well, again, I'm not a cover crops expert um but it is well known that um sometimes having um having those mixtures of crops can um help suppress um weed pest and disease burden um again it's one of my colleague uh, several of my colleagues that's their their line of work um but but certainly we are seeing um some of those um you know suppression of weeds and pests and disease well particularly weeds is really critical um given that we've got so few actives um that's definitely a definitely a thing going forward so things like oats and um clover mixtures and things like that um also in our maize space looking at um intero cropping that sort of thing has has been done um not my area particularly but i do know that there is some suppression um within that space thank you i mean it certainly at the... hutchinson's we we're doing a lot of work on cover crops, but it's choosing cover crops to do a specific task, maybe to improve soil structure, to build fertility in the soil, to act as a trap crop, to attract you know, different pests away from the crop. So it's choosing it to do a specific role, really. Thank you, uh, David, and thank you, Joe. And there's a nice question here from Andrew. As a farmer, I've seen over the past two years, large populations of ladybirds is this because we're using IPM methodology and not just using insecticides at the first sign of aphids? Who would um, like well, if I'll have a first stab at that one, I think it's it's probably a combination of uh, factors. In fact, that you know we've had tend to have milder winters, which has fostered the survival of ladybirds better. Um, yes, we've we've lost obviously a lot. Some of their more dodgier insecticides like clopyrifos for example which has probably meant that there's been better survival of ladybirds because the uh, the alternatives and things like the neonics were probably less harmful to ladybirds um so yeah i don't think it's just one simple thing but you know the whole ipm ethos i think where you're encouraging the survival uh, providing shelter for you know, things like wildflower um, edges to, to crops and so on all kind of helps the survival of uh, ladybirds and other beneficial insects. And then they'll repay you by um, keeping on top of aphids, um, which may mean either using no aphicides at all, or maybe just one treatment, maybe needed in the season. Okay, thank you. Um, if nobody else is gonna say anything, we'll, we'll move on. And there's a question from James about how significant is the overuse of nitrogen, particularly AN, on foliar disease? So like, we referred uh, earlier to well-nourished crops being more resilient, but the exception would be overfed ones, um, where we know that there can be a link, um, denser, lusher, softer foliage, um, and that can be a driver. So again, there, there are win-wins in there and optimising the efficiency of your nitrogen um, and not encouraging disease. But this is one I would really like to hear what David's got to say. Yeah, I think that the word you use there, optimising the nitrogen, is absolutely crucial. Not going over the top, not going under, but try and, uh, and optimise the level you need. We certainly don't want too thick a crop uh, because that will encourage things like septoria and so on. On the other hand, you don't want too thin a crop. I mean, that can help mildew get in amongst the plants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You also need to look at things like uh, making sure you've got adequate manganese, uh, and so on, because we know that low levels of manganese can uh, boost mildew levels. So it's getting optimal nutrition of the crop. And, and so knowing what's in the soil is actually very important, which gets back to the soil health aspect we talked about earlier. But it's using optimum inputs rather than too much or too little. OK, thank you. Uh, we don't have much time left, just five minutes. So I'll just ask a couple more questions. What, quite a general question that I've had that nobody's brought up yet, but I think it's worth just to mention is maybe to Joe is how can someone implement IPM successfully on a farm? That's um, that's something that you know the the great thing about IPM is it's not really prescriptive, and you can start really small. You can start with just a single paddock. Uh, and you can compare that to the other paddocks within your farm. So it might be selecting a more resistant cultivar. It might be, 
you know, sewing one paddock 10 days later than your other paddock. It might be having a really good look and doing some really good crop walking and deciding actually on balance, I don't need this um, this T0 application because I don't have any septoria and I don't have any rust in my crop. Uh, it might be, you know, just because I can use, just because the label says I can use two SDHIs doesn't mean that I should. That's, those are the sorts of things that you can do. They're really easy wins, and a lot of farmers are doing it without even thinking about it. And it's having trust in that system, and because it's really easy to trust a prescriptive system, because you know you get the list and you stick to it. Um, but having an IPM system gives you a lot of flexibility, and it's just about getting confidence to trust in that flexibility. I think that's okay. yeah. You can start small, and then you can scale it up. It's a it's an easy thing to do. No, I think that's really nicely put, Joe. And I'm very keen that, I mean, again, that this fear that people make IPM seem something other and very complex. The idea that you just, you start, we're all doing it and incrementally you improve it and there'll be big jumps with some new technology. Um, and some of the trickier things we've discussed today, you know, cropping mixtures, they might be at the, the end that some people will be comfortable with but there are certainly very easy wins in the here and now that we can get busy with okay, it's utilizing you. cultural techniques isn't it so choice mm. of variety thinking about drill date the impact drilling early drilling late all of these aspects have have an impact overall so monitoring crops have you reached a threshold etc cetera, etc cetera. so all of these things are part of uh, ipm and, okay, I, and I will just and I and I will just quickly add that you know actually chemistry does play a really important part of 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 an IPM strategy. That's by no means saying don't use it. It's being using the right thing at the right time at the right amount. Exactly. You're here. Thank you. I, I'm going to ask one very quick question. We're almost out of time, and it's one that David asked quite early on. How much of a role does healthy soil play in keeping the plants healthy from disease? Does anybody have expertise to answer that? I think we kind of covered that earlier, Ian. So, um, have we been through that one? Yeah, which is okay, not sorry, I've got too many questions here. I'm losing the track. The soil. <laughs> in, <laughs> in that case, we have answered almost everything. Um, I think we should stop there. It's been great um, that everybody took the time to come to this evening session. Actually, we should probably do it more often. A big thanks to the panellists, particularly David and Joe, for coming from outside our usual system. And a very special thanks to Joe for um, beaming all the way from New Zealand. And we hope you have a nice rest of the day while we all put our pyjamas on and start getting <laughs> So Yeah, you don't so really. Sorry, you might not know that I might be in my pyjamas. Um, I might well, you just might be. You might be. You might, I might well be in my pyjamas. <laughs> So, so thanks everybody, it's been a great session. Uh, thanks for all the questions and all the input and we look forward to talking to you again soon. And, and if there are any questions that we didn't answer, and there are one or two, we'll try and put them on the Plant Health Centre website. Uh, and so you'll be able to go to the Plant Health Centre website, planthealthcentre.scot uh, to get the answers to those. So thank you very much and good night and good morning, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Good night. Night. night.